From the HBA Podcast Studio in New York City, welcome to The Medium Rules. I'm Alan Baldishan. My, my invitation, my offering for Amazon is to be thinking in a, in a broader, longer, more temporal context. People stopped using Uber for a while. I bet you every single one of those people has used Uber since. We have this conflictual model of development, like the business wants this, the local groups or NGOs want this, and they battle it out. You had politicians who were in favor of HQ2 who ultimately were driving forces against it. The, these old models aren't going to work anymore. Backroom deals, top down. I would also connect it to what's going on politically well, in the country. Yeah. Joining me today in the HBA podcast studio are Ari Wallach and Duff McDonald. Um, we had the pleasure of connecting with Ari previously on our very first episode of The Medium Rules last June. Um, for those of you who didn't get to listen to that podcast, Ari is the CEO of Long Path Labs, whose mission is to promote and advocate long-term modes of thinking, synthesizing, and responding to humanity's greatest long-term challenges. Also joining today is Duff McDonald, a first-timer on The Medium Rules. Uh, Duff is a New York-based journalist and is the author, most recently, of the New York Times bestsellers The Golden Passport and The Firm. A longtime magazine writer, Duff has written for The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, New York Magazine, Esquire, Fortune, Business Week, Wired, Time, and other publications. Duff wrote the book review for The New York Times on Brad Stone's essential book on Amazon, The Everything Store, which is what we're going to talk about today as we'll get to. Duff is currently working on a book with Christiane Lemieux about what makes entrepreneurs tick. And Christiane is the founder and CEO of The Inside and herself a previous guest on The Medium Rules. So today, uh, Ari and Duff are joining to discuss the Amazon HQ2 pullout. Uh, like many New Yorkers, uh, we all have both very strong and I think very mixed feelings about what feels like it will prove to be a seminal event, not only in the way decisions are made about land use and economic development and corporate subsidies in New York City, but possibly all over the country. So guys, thank you very much for coming in. I think this will be sort of a freewheeling discussion uh, that'll take different paths and I think different topics we're going to hit. Uh, let's but take the long path. Let's take the That's long good. path. And, and unfortunately, you. I have eight different bulleted talking points that I need to get through, uh, so it will not be freewheeling. Please cut them down to <laughs> no, four. Um, so let me set the table here. Um, last November uh, 2018, after an extended bidding process, um, involving initially 280 cities responding to RFPs, uh, then narrowed down to 20 cities, Amazon announced with much fanfare that Long Island City in Queens, New York, uh, was selected as its second global headquarters, HQ2. The states, New York State's agreement uh, with Amazon guaranteed $27, bill $27 billion in revenue for New York, uh, 25,000 new jobs, going up to 40,000 jobs ultimately, um, and it uh, promised $3 billion a return to Amazon in various forms of tax credits, uh, principally state, but also uh, principally state tax credits. In February of this year, on Valentine's Day, day no less, uh, picking that day slightly tone deaf on Amazon's part, and I think we'll see a theme there, Amazon abruptly canceled its plans entirely citing mounting criticism it received from local politicians and activists and basically pulled out. The main criticisms from the so-called resistance to the deal uh, were that the Amazon HQ2 would cause housing costs to skyrocket in Long Island City and that part of Queens, uh, drive out low-income residents, and worsen congestion on the subway and the streets. Uh, I think there were also feelings, as we'll talk about, that the new jobs would not go to locals, but would be imports um, and would not be evenly distributed across service workers and the local community. People have distilled the story into three categories. Subsidies, corporate giveaways, secrecy and backroom dealings, and issues of corporate social responsibility and corporate behavior, and, and, and I think we'll get into all three. Um, but let's talk about Amazon for a moment. Uh, Amazon is a company that is consistently and outspokenly focused on the long term. In that sense, and Ari, this is a theme of yours, it would seem that Amazon would be a perfect long pathian corporation. On the flip side, Amazon has a reputation as being predatory. Uh, everyone may not subscribe to this view, but it's out there. 
Some would assert that Amazon deliberately uses its massive market power and data sets to favor its products and services and crush competition in an unfair way. It is also known for fairly severe working conditions and being fairly hostile to unions, although that doesn't necessarily uh, distinguish Amazon, but that's the case. Let me just start by asking you guys, how do you think about Amazon when we think of HQ2? Let's take a top line here. And Ari, let's start with you. But let's go with some just initial impressions. Uh, so look, and I think Amazon, um, in many ways, is, is a manifestation of uh, Jeff Bezos' overarching philosophy that you need to think about the customer and what the customer wants. So before we go into kind of the multiple critiques I know of, of Amazon, one of, one of the things, and you know this from the, the review of the book, is in, in most of his meetings, there's always an empty chair, right? This, this theoretical empty chair, which even though there'll be a bunch of executives there, the empty chair represents what, what, the, what the customer wants. And so I've been thinking about what happened with HQ2 and thinking about that empty chair and thinking about that, how do we how do we delight and meet the needs of the customer, which has, I think, led Amazon to be in many ways as big as they are because this is what they're constantly thinking. I mean, like, as I was walking out my door, I tripped, as I often do, over an Amazon Prime box, as do, I think, a, a, a very large number of Americans who may be critical of Amazon, but also have the box, the proverbial Prime box that they, they trip over uh, every, every morning. Um, and so in thinking about that chair, where I think they could have done a better job with HQ2 is thinking about who is in who is in that chair and who the customers are and who the stakeholders are, right? So it's one thing to think about what I want. I want that next day delivery, right? And they're, they're really good at that. But I think as they move forward in this economy, in this country, around the world, that, that chair that's always held open for the customer needs to be expanded both to all the stakeholders in the communities in which they operate and how they think about that and to future customers. And what I mean by that is like transgenerationally. So Bezos is doing great thinking around what he's doing with Blue Origin and thinking about the next couple of hundred years. I think it behooves Amazon to be thinking about who's in that chair and who will be in that chair for the next several decades in everything that they do, be it their their climate impact work, which as you saw a bunch of employees over just in the past week, um, have basically signed an open revolting, re somehow. revolting, and saying yeah. we have to do something around do climate. More, do yeah. do more. Um, again, I think this keeps speaking back to that empty chair and who is in that chair. So is it just me ordering something from my kitchen table? That's great, and that gives you an amazing market cap and makes you one of the wealthiest, the wealthiest person on the planet. But at the same time, we have to think about that chair being a transgenerational chair, right? And the next several generations, both who will sit in that chair and who will be impacted by the work that they do. And so that's my, my invitation, my offering for Amazon is to be thinking in a, in a broader, longer, more temporal context around the work that they do. That's my top line on Amazon. Okay. Duff, give me your top line. What's, yeah. how, how are you distilling this? I, I think Ari makes a great point because the the – Jeff Bezos's maniacal focus on the customer has us all in a devil's bargain with this company, right? Remember Delete Uber? Uh, same thing. A lot of people stopped using Uber for a while. I bet you every single one of those people has used Uber since the day they said they weren't going to. We the, the the sort of state of our culture is we have a level of apathy where we are willing to tolerate. Uh, uh, Amazon's notorious and flagrant disregard for workers, disregard for state taxes, for convenience. You know, you could extend the argument to Facebook too, right? They're, s they're selling our data as they say they're protecting it. And how many people have actually been able to break up with that particular app? So I think what Bezos has done is... Not, not only protecting, I'm sorry to interrupt, but getting breached getting it breached. Also. Oh, yeah, yeah entirely. Yeah. Not, like, not, not it, safeguarding it, abusing it, and not safeguarding that it. That company is an exercise in hypocrisy, right? Sheryl Sandberg actually said there, uh, you know, we need to do a better job of protecting your data. That was one of her lines in the middle of last, uh, you know, when the stuff started climaxing last year. It's like, you have never been protecting the data of your customers. 
you need to do a better job of it, you're selling it as fast as you can. So Amazon, I think, presents us just with, you know, the extreme example of that, right? We've got a company that is not a good corporate citizen to in with regard to most stakeholders, say for customers, and uh, uh, we somehow tolerate it. So when, when we come back to the New York thing, what's my top line? It's like, other than the sheer size of the uh, project and what the potential for that was, I don't, th you know, I, it doesn't really move me that Amazon may not come to New York City. Like if you're gonna make a list of, of corporate citizens that we would welcome, you know, it might still be short, but Amazon wouldn't be near the top of it, ex except for the, the mere fact of the size. That's it. Ari, let me ask you this. So the, the, the resistance, so to speak, um, what do you make of it? What do you make of the merits of the resistance? And, and, and I think that, um, again, there were issues with respect to secrecy and, and, and lack of transparency in Albany. Uh, the New York City Council was cut out of the decision-making process. And, you know, as we know, the uh, New York State Senate tried to remedy that uh, by nominating Giannis to one of the boards that would have a veto over the project, which it turns out Cuomo could have overridden, but that was the death blow. So you had secrecy and transparency issues. You had a big community uprising coming out of Queens based on issues of displacement, uh, based on issues of diversity. Um, did you, do you view the, uh, do you view the, 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 the resistance and the criticisms, criticisms there as legitimate? Um, do you think that uh, they were justified in how influential they ultimately were in getting, getting Amazon to pull out? Or do you, do you view that as a, as a, as a, mis a lost opportunity and a mistake? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna not answer that in the binary way that it was set up. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I think it was a missed opportunity, but it was a missed opportunity. Uh, let's go back. the The way things have traditionally been done no longer works, and it, it's interesting that Amazon, um, you know, they do what you normally do. You you hire some top flight uh, public affairs firms, which are usually staffed by former chief of staffs in Senate office or congressional offices, and they'll do things in closed meeting rooms with other people and they kind of negotiate and the public is kind of let, like this has gone on not just for decades, but for centuries. Um, and it's interesting that Amazon being at the forefront of this kind of digital evolution of commerce kind of got not just blindsided, but the don't know, don't know there was that transparency what the digital revolution has brought in terms of transparency and people's mindsets about inclusion in a process they didn't lean into right so they were doing it the old school way but folks now who are used to interestingly enough when i go to shop for something it used to be i would go into a store there was a price and i'd be like well like you know, $99 for that, that sounds about right. Now what people do is they open up the Amazon app and they check and they look for transparency and, and they have access to all this information. So in many ways, this kind of revolution in commerce that that Amazon has brought in terms of trice, price transparency, um, they didn't use, they didn't leverage that same mindset and understanding how you actually do things in a political, politically as savvy way as possible. And so... They got, in some ways, out. They they got outflanked by the very mindset and desires that they built into customers and to all of us in the first place. We're now used to seeing everything. We want total transparency. They're the, one of the ones who pushed that into the realm, even that that was even a possibility. And then when they use the kind of old school process of, well, you come in, you see one price on the shelf, take it or leave it. It's just interesting that mm -hmm. they got. Caught sort of with hoisted this. on their own petard somehow. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, it, it was it is Amazon that has created this entire mindset of transparency, and then they didn't leverage what they actually did, or you know, and, and push forward. So that that's the first thing that comes to mind. And thinking about this is, wow, you got caught by your own net and your own mindset that you've 
put out into the world. Um, and so that that's first and foremost. And then on, on your second, was it a missed opportunity? Here's the issue. Like, you need jobs in general to keep an, an economy going. And as the percentage of people around the world, specifically in America, move to urban centers, you're going to have to try and figure out jobs that make sense for as many people as possible. And what this was doing, and what I think the missed opportunity was, was not just for the construction jobs, which we're going to go out through 2033, and not just for the $100,000 plus jobs that were going to happen with people who are moving in, who are going to be doing advertising, data analytics, and whatnot. It was going to be what they were going to be doing for the general overarching educational ecosystem in the city. So when you looked at some of the plans of what they were talking about doing in terms of internships and training and going out into the high schools, and uh, I think the missed opportunity was elevating our overall state of play and thinking among not just the workforce of 2019 through 2030, but all the way through 2040 and 2045. Now, we can disagree and say, or folks can disagree, that those aren't the right jobs. Those are not the jobs that we want. But things are moving in a direction where we are not going to open uh, a heavy industrial plant on the waterfront. And so if we want to ensure that the, the jobs are there for my children, who are all under the age of 10, a <clears throat> two 10-year-old and a six-year-old, what are we doing to ensure they have the right skills? Having the employers, even if you don't want them to work for Amazon, having and ensuring that they are there helping guide the educational frameworks, not, not own them, because not everyone should be thinking about, oh, I need to be educated so I can work at Amazon one point. But thinking in a in a digital native first way that was a, that was a missed opportunity. Tough. So I got to read this quote that I sort of getting ready for this uh, for this podcast <clears throat> last night just jumped out at me, and this was in the Washington Post, ironically owned by uh, Bezos, obviously in in February sixteenth this year, two days after the pullout. Um, the collapse of Amazon's project in Queens led to an intense round of finger pointing uh, among the company, politicians who supported the project, and those who opposed it. Opinion polls showed strong popular backing for the project in principle, but there was less support for the subsidies. I think we'll come back to the subsidies because I think there's an interesting discussion there. Also, opponents were organized and vocal. Quote, this is a disaster on all fronts, said Richard Florida, a professor of the University of Toronto School of Cities. He said Amazon erred by picking a site in the part of the city filled with liberal sympathizers in unions and community groups. Bezos should stand up and fire the site selection team, quote unquote, Florida said, referring to Amazon's founder and chief executive who also owns the Washington Post. Anyone who is sentient would have said, you are putting this in a hotbed of activism. Somebody didn't do their homework. What do you make of that? Uh, the, so the part about Bezos should fire yeah. somebody, uh, this one goes all the way to the top, right? This is, uh, they, how does that happen? they didn't, they didn't calculate? inform him of their decision after the fact, right? So I don't think, I think this one, if, if you want to look at Amazon and say, uh, who blew this, it's Bezos, right? Right. This is the biggest announcement they've made unmade in years so i think blame for this one can go right to the top uh but f uh richard florida's right like this is <clears throat> i i think i think the people of new york or or a lot of the debate afterwards and we saw some of this at a panel the other night sort of focused on amazon bringing a tech ecosystem enhancing our tech ecosystem i think that's off the mark uh amazon may use tech uh, but it's a retailer. I think the the uh, the the jobs at Amazon aren't the kind we think of that uh, you know spin off little baby uh, uh, Googles and stuff from the people who'd work there. You're not going to get uh, you know we have enough um, uh, re you know shopping the, startups shopping startups already, and and they're not exactly. You know, that they've got their huge cloud business. But, you know, when was the last time you heard about a breakout company founded by an Amazon vet? 
I couldn't even. I was trying to think of one uh, in preparation for this. I'm sure I couldn't, they exist. I don't know. I'm sure it. they exist. But I couldn't think of one. So, uh, but back to your point about the neighborhood, absolutely right. Why? Yeah, uh, I read something uh, this morning that there were that like two dozen parts of the city were competing for the for the right to yeah. to host this, and you know how they ended up in in uh, the the where they did is beyond me. I think Bezos wasn't paying attention. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's one of those things where, on the one hand, hindsight's twenty twenty. On the other hand, it really was plain as day. And, you know, to me, it sort of implicates corporate decision-making, you know, smartest guys in the room kind of dynamic. Um, in that, um, you know, in this political moment, what Richard Florida is saying rings true, and, and maybe it's hindsight, but, you know, you can imagine these guys sitting with, you know, just a map in their office in Seattle, on the water, great transit, you know, outside Manhattan, so there are all these tax credits available, which is the case. A lot of the tax credits they were taking advantage of wouldn't have been the case had they been on, in Manhattan, south of 96th Street. So, so in a vacuum, you could write a case study where the the location made sense, right? That that's that's kind of where I'm going. Right. So yeah. I wrote a piece for the Times when I was working on uh, the Golden Passport about uh, uh, who hires the most MBAs, and Amazon at the time I wrote it. This is several years ago, uh, f- five, four or five years ago, was the number one hirer of MBAs in the country. So is Which is it incredible right? actually that it's not Goldman Sachs yeah. or Google or So it's not surprising that a case study that made sense in you know in the in within the four walls of HQ in Seattle uh you know came out and was Crashed dead on arrival. Yeah. yeah. I also think but I want to I want to put out an alternative future or actually an alternative past, an alternative future connected to it. I think the, the, the massively missed opportunity would have been for them actually to place it there. But instead of having this announcement where they just kind of drop it and say, we're, we're doing this, yeah. can, you, can you imagine this, an alternative parallel universe, Amazon having conversations with community groups like Make the Road? Um, who are you know one of the one of the main kind of resistance groups pushing back because at, at, and look 32 BJ was into this they wanted it its jobs which right? is a local union local union. In Queens and in Queens because um, they already had a kind of a deal in place to service any jobs on that site with the re- doesn't matter who went in there so they were for it because right now there's nothing there so it, it would have been jobs you can imagine and they also had a work within the system yeah they had a work, a they had a work within too. a system yeah but in my alternative history and future Amazon would have picked this location but instead of just kind of announcing it it would have had a number of not just town halls where like we answer your questions but literally kind of appreciative collaborative inquiry sessions with all these community groups because at the end of the day like most of the stuff that's for sale on Amazon most like you want you need like people want jobs there's commerce like in 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 this how, whether you're social, a democratic socialist, or some even former socialist, there's still going to be some form of commerce, right? And so the, the missed opportunity in my, in my alternative universe, Amazon would have had these conversations, this kind of middleware with these groups about like what is important, what is not important, what do you want, what do you not want? You know, one of the examples is one of the main pushbacks was when, when HQ2 would have gone in, all of the rents would have gone through the roof, right? In in the local area, this was the pushback. This usually as a, happens. As a matter of fact, there was there were there were canaries in the coal mine there, where there were sales going on post announcement, pre pullout, where totally. prices were skyrocketing. Yeah, so, so the, that was that was the not conversation. Just speculation. The conversation that but it would have been had would have been bringing this to the attention of Amazon, working with the city council, putting in kind of price control, so you didn't have immediate flipping. I mean, there's there are solutions to so many of the things that there was pushback on this. It could have been an amazing, going back to this case study, a case study of actually how you do this, right? And so that's what we need. So the binary is like, well, we don't want this. We do want this. It was great. We, we, we pushed Amazon out. It's also a missed opportunity to think about, like, how do we do this? Like, how do we think about not just economic growth, because that's a whole other podcast about 
growth on a finite planet. We can't grow infinitely. But how do we grow and evolve commerce and economics within a city, within the urban footprint, in a way that is equitable, inclusive, and just for all? Um, this would have been an amazing case study on how you do that, right? And I don't just mean, so it could have been rent controls. If you, so if you look at the list of things that there was pushback from the resistance, I think, look, there was an element with the resistance that just doesn't like Amazon, and it's not about Amazon in Long Island City. It's about Amazon as, a, as an actor, and they would be happy with no Amazon full stop and just uh, mom and pop stores, like just an eradication of it as an entity. So if you so if you believe in that, there's probably no room for what I'm lay, laying out. But if you if you take that off the table and say, well, there's still going to be an Amazon, there should still be Amazon because we should have that that freedom to create right. in that way. All the list of their I think could have all been spoken for and taken care of. Everything from minimum wage to rent controls to training and everything and the missed opportunity was to engage in that type of conversation a priori of the announcement we just don't have uh to be honest we, we don't have like organizations or firms that do that we have this conflictual model of development like the business wants this the local groups or ngos want this and they battle it out and there's no kind of collaborative switzerland entity or way of even having this and that to me is a takeaway sort of un almost a place well, where people can talk having had the un as a client i can I mean, say that that yeah. it, i know I, that's a swear word in it's, some a swear, ways, I, it's, it's fine with me it's but it, th that that is the thing that i came out of most of this is like wow we it's like we are missing that entity and that set of skills to have these conversations in general. So in many ways, this was emblematic of the general polarization we see in society. We don't have these kind of discourse models or platforms or even ways of thinking about how we bring folks together ahead of time. It just becomes a conflict-based model, which was just unfortunate. Duff, uh, do you think there's a parallel universe where this could have been pulled off, or do you tend to sort of agree with uh, Florida's sort of analysis that this was doomed from the start. Yeah, I think I think uh, Long Island, so. uh, yes and no is okay. my answer. Like, I think absolutely uh, if if it had been played differently, uh, we could have seen a different result. That said, uh, you know, there's two kinds of companies now, right? Like if it, you can see Mark Zuckerberg these days, right? We got the lasso around him. He's he he is now obliged to answer our complaints or seems to feel he is and then there's other companies where uh you know when was the last time you actually heard larry or sergey weigh in on something personally right it's, in fact they seem to be going the opposite direction right yeah. and bezos has made a career here you know it's no surprise he's from the hedge fund world right it's where he doesn't He's not having this conversation with us. And it's worked for him so far. Because if you look at all the workers' rights stuff, uh, all their warehouse workers, like some of the stats from Brad Stone's book were just egregious, right? An extra 10 minutes of uh, rest time when the temperature topped 100 degrees. Uh, the state tax issue, we never saw him respond to it. So I think as, a, as sort of a corporate MO, uh, something as big as HQ2 was a Bezos level thing, right? But he doesn't, he's not having a conversation with the rest of us. So it would have been nice had it, we've been able to be there, but I don't think Amazon is the company that was gonna get us there because when is the last time you saw Just him? Because of who they are, yeah. right? I mean, that is an interesting question about, is this Amazon specific? Is it Long Island City specific or are there broader lessons about corporate subsidies? And in that sense, I want to Game of Thrones like move up the state. If we could have cue the Game of Thrones music and, and animation up to Albany. Um, because my uh, bet noir there is Cuomo. And of course, between Cuomo and de Blasio, the finger pointing uh, was just as you would expect, out of control. Um, but, you know, uh, Cuomo uh, baked this deal in private, cut out the city council, um, tried to crush the resistance, um, and 
almost wrote its epitaph out of the gate. Um, why did? But that's but but hit the playbook he ran has worked for him mm -hmm. and has worked for Albany and has worked for the rich and powerful in and around New York City and state for years. Hudson Yards, Yankee Stadium, Atlantic Yards. Finally, they hit a wall on this one. And I would say people got sick of it, and it was a perfect storm of pushing back on that kind of politics. And this involved all the elements that you usually see in New York State, real estate, backroom dealing. I mean, you may as well have thrown uh, Shilver, uh, Shelly Silver and Dean Skelos in there, both in jail at the moment, I believe, if they're still, still rotting in there. Um, so, you know, I, I guess when I look at this, uh, I put a lot of blame on the structural elements about how decisions are made and sort of tectonically maybe that's starting to change for the better. Yeah, look, the, going back to what I said earlier, the, 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 these old models aren't going to work anymore. Backroom deals, top down, lack of transparency, lack of input. Um, you can't expect uh, a people and specifically younger generations to grow up as kind of DIY, uh, growing up on Wikipedia where everyone can go in there and edit, where everyone kind of has an access. There aren't like so many locked doors. That's a mindset. That's the way you grow up. I see it in the folks that I work with and the students that I teach at Columbia. Th this, this old Albany way, it, it still works a little bit, but like not for long. And so the, the overall governance systems um, that again uh, are emblematic of an old way of doing it. And that old way is exactly what Amazon went up against and pushed through is now going to pervade politics. And so I think this is not a one-off. This is a beginning of folks realizing both up in Albany, but in Long Island City, be it uh, first generation immigrants or the heads of NGOs, that the old ways of doing things aren't going to work. And I think it was a combination of a lot of forces, but this was not so much a shot across the bow, but this was this was the big sink. This is the torpedo that says, like, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Duff, let me ask you this. How do you see that sort of power dynamic shifting and or not shifting? I mean, you know, I, I mentioned Albany. I, I, I would also connect it to what's going on politically well, in the country. Yeah, right yeah, now. I was just going to say, yeah. I think you need to think, look at the timing, too, with the midterms. Right. Like it couldn't have been a worse time uh, to uh, sort of blithely uh, I w not ignore, but just try to cut out uh, a constituency that ha was feeling a renewed sense of, oh, my God, maybe we do have uh, still have a say. Yeah. And. Um, you know, maybe, you know, Cuomo was just getting a little too uh, b b arrogant uh, to, to have sort of put that into the, the mix, too, because, you know, is, what, is it, was it not at the same time that we were served the uh, secret uh, L train uh, <laughs> yes. uh, rehab plan, yes. which is yes. still not even... And, and no one knows really no what the truth is uh, in terms of what's going to And that and that seems that's acceptable in Albany to say uh, no. Actually, uh, the answer isn't something that's going to cause all you people pain. It's actually great news for you, but I can't explain. It. So, so there's a level of arrogance going in there that that I think it was it you know could could this deal have gone through easier a year previous maybe because you had a lot of people on on the left nationally but also even locally just sort of wondering if you know the world had completely gone to hell and it was never to coming back again i think they got caught in a bit of a bind uh by people waking up and being a little more enthusiastic about what the power of of the people can do mm -hmm. uh so I, I think that totally played into it yeah yeah are any thoughts on the, that sort of broader <clears throat> political context of the moment yeah i mean the, you know this will sound funny coming from a a table of three older white dudes but the the, the 
the su sudden realization by older white dudes, some of them maybe even younger than me, that that people of color, especially women of color, have, have been traditionally cut out of all of these conversations, but didn't necessarily always have the tools to push back, that realization is now coming to fruition, and it's now manifesting in, in what we're seeing. And this goes, this goes back, this is Florida, this is Stacey Abrams, like across the board, um, the ability to kind of just shove things through uh, is no longer gonna be taken. Right, and so I think this th this coming when it when it did, um, it had that extra energy behind it, and and I think in, in in that way, folks need to realize that this is this is the beginning or the middle of the end of that older way of doing Albany. Like Albany is synonymous with with just that back room dudes making decisions. Uh, it needs to come to an end. It's coming to an end, and I think it's coming to an end. Uh, nationally and in some ways I'd say internationally and it and it it, it speaks also to this kind of neo-populist moment both on obviously on the right but also on on the left where there's a lever a level of power rebalancing that those who've traditionally been in power are not necessarily recognizing as happening and it's and they have a strategy for what they're going to do, but a strategy, as my friend Mike Tyson says, is what everyone has them to get punched in the face. That punch in the face is happening across the board. And again, going back to what I said earlier, it's we we, we will continue to see this. Con we see this with yellow. I see yellow vests and what happened at HQ two happening in France as some of the same dynamics that are playing out in terms of elites pushing an agenda without either building consensus or speaking to the folks who are usually at the tail end of those policies getting screwed, um, these things are all coming back and we're going to start seeing more and more of this. And my hope and desire is that the biggest lesson that comes out of this for Amazon around HQ2, but in general, all actors, um, is that we they need to be thinking critically about putting new mechanisms in place. So not so they can get in front of this in terms of PR or communications, but, they re but in, in terms of democracy, right? In terms of, literally thinking about how people are brought into the conversation about major things that will impact their life, not post facto, but a priori of that, and our governance systems that go back hundreds of years as kind of re the republic model itself, uh, because of, I mean, we have this book by McLuhan on the table, because of the kind of digital evolution, it's something that everyone has to take very, very seriously. And this, this Albany model, as both metaphor and real, is, is ending. The corporate subsidy piece of this we haven't necessarily touched on. Um, we touched on it a little bit, but I guess having read more and more about this over the last, you know, in preparation for, for this taping, you know, I, I think I would, I would say that, you know, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you saw a lot about $3 billion giveaway, but when you, when you drill down on it, um, the corporate subsidies were not nearly as bad as, as advertised. They were tied to jobs. Um, they were tied to development. Um, certainly the way the decision-making went down merits criticism. Uh, but I don't personally think the subsidies uh, merit criticism. There's been much worse uh, that's gone pretty much unnoticed by the broader sort of New York intelligence uh, slash community activist slash resistance. Um, so, what do, so what are we left with? We're left with it was bad process, um, and we're left with the somewhat, um, you know, legitimate but I think difficult argument of it would have caused displacement, it would have changed the character of the neighborhood, but in some sense that's just – Development. That's a trade-off. The, the, there would have been a ton of jobs and a ton of revenue. Net-net, how do you feel about it looking back? Let, let, let's take Amazon out of it um, for a second because in some sense they are maybe not easy to criticize, but, 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 but they're a pretty big target. How do you feel about it going, go, coming away? Do you think it was a, a, a win and a net good? What lessons do you draw? You know, Ari was just talking about how the old model 
uh, of, um, you know, with a with an eye to the politics of it, is hopefully changing. But we're at, like we're at a we're at a point in history too, where, where there's a parallel, where it appears that there may be cracks in the foundations of shareholder capitalism. Right. So the other stakeholder argument um, doesn't just apply on the level of uh, um, different communities and, and within a city like New York. It's also um, the, the, the corporate world is, is being asked to answer questions like, uh, what about the other stakeholders that you deal with beyond your shareholders? And I think one of the, to me, and you know, I wasn't in those meetings, so God knows, but um, I think that it was easier for this deal to fall apart than it might have otherwise been because it was Amazon. Uh, uh, Ari started by saying, you know, focusing us on their, you know, maniacal devotion to their customer. So they have customer and shareholders covered. That's it. Uh, they uh, don't have a great track record with communities. They don't have a great track record uh, with uh, the taxpayers, with, 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 with paying their fair share of taxes. So I think you had a, a, a vulnerable entity here at a particular moment in time. So I think it's good news. Uh, not that it didn't happen, but that it may be an indication that um, it, it's not just Fair. shareholders above all anymore. The other thing I'd point out, and then I'd love Ari's uh, input on this, sort of just lessons learned and what you draw from it. Uh, this, it, it, Well, let me say this. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis Amazon, um, I think one of the things uh, that, 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 that motivated the resistance was the example of, of Seattle. And we heard at the panel we were all at on Wednesday night on this topic that, in fact, uh, there were activists from Seattle that came out to Long Island City and met with the resistance in Long Island City in Queens and basically gave them ammunition about what uh, Amazon has done to communities in Seattle, driving, up, dri driving out uh, service workers um, and people of you know, middle to low income out of the city making it unaffordable um so you know we didn't have to guess about that and and i think amazon specifically had a lot to answer for there but ari if you could wave a magic wand <laughs> and you could get your middleware session and you could get the openness so let's take let, let's assume it was done in the open in a much more transparent way that uh cuomo didn't bypass the city council he didn't so rile up local uh, politicians that they actually flipped. Mm -hmm. uh, you had politicians who were in favor of HQ2 who ultimately were driving forces against it, like Gianaris, um, like Gail Brewer. Um, had process been open, and let's assume uh, that with an open process this would have gone down, would that have been a good thing from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, what I if I had my if I had my magic wand, so so Deborah Axe, who's one of the co-leaders of, of Make the Road New York, um, who's kind of at the tip of the spear for the resistance. In my magic wand, the site selection committee would have met with her on day one. Said, "Look, we're looking at coming to New York. What like this is this is who we are. This is what we do. Like and it, and look at that point, Anna. She could have said, "No thanks. We don't we don't want you here. Full stop." And that would have been one conversation, but I'd like to think it'd be like a little bit more open in my, my, in my magic wand, her and the folks that she represents and works with and other organizations would have been in that process all the way through because you can't foist a business model on everyone forever and expect it to work in the long term, right? So I think I would like to think Jeff Bezos is thinking about what is Amazon 200 years from now? And for it to exist 200 years from now, most companies don't, right? A majority of them burn out after about 50, 60 years. For it to be here 200, 300 years from now, it's going to have to meet the needs of all stakeholders, not just those with prime accounts, um, which is 
us, but everyone across the board. Is there board, anyone who doesn't have a prime? There's another, <laughs> you know, and so like so here's an let me let me drive a very specific example. So the Amazon Go store, which have you even been in one? You you go in, you swipe yeah, your it's phone. Cashless, it's right. cashless. You go in. There's a barcode on your app. You go and you take whatever you want off the shelves, put it in your pocket, and walk out. Sounds great, right? Um, San Francisco just passed uh, like a, lo- a local ordinance that says you cannot have cashless stores. Why? Because there's, depending on the numbers that you look at, 35 to 55% of the community is unbanked. They don't actually, they don't have a smartphone and they don't have a credit card. So they actually can engage in commerce. So now uh, those in charge of Amazon Go are trying to figure out how do we, how do we meet the needs of everyone? I'd like to think in my magic wand world that this is something that would, instead of it having to be an ordinance and something that's retroactive in a kind of, in my middleware ideal state, this would have been conversations beforehand and actually not so much for Amazon to kind of solve for it uh, in, in a traditional engineering way, but actually say, oh, you know what? If 30 to 40% of a population within a city are unbanked, and Citibank and the big banks aren't willing to meet those needs, we'll do it. We'll figure it out. I mean, this is disruptive innovation isn't just meeting the needs of the top 10%. It's ideally the needs of 100%. Um, and so in my, in, my, in my magic, I'm not saying Amazon is going to become a cooperative and like, uh, but maybe it is, right? Like it, Uber it, enlightened, good guy, right? Uh, well, it's enlightened, but it's thinking about the, the business models of the previous several centuries are not going to work anymore because they are based on the primacy of the actual shareholder, the one who holds the shares, uh, and not the not overall all stakeholders. So in my magic wand, this would be – and look, I, I read Bezos, the, the letters that he writes every year. They're these amazing letters that really give you an insight into how he and the, and, the, and the company are thinking. And in this year's letter, they talk about failure and how do you learn from failure. And I think the, the learnings from HQ2 – hopefully are not, we need to hire better public affairs firms. And It's what do we do to meet the needs of as many people as possible so that all flourish, not just who own the stock, not just the $100,000 tech workers, but in the communities that we work with. So in my magic wand, this is a, a, a learning moment and a failure for Amazon and other companies to think about how do they in the 21st, 22nd, 23rd century do what they're going to do in a way that doesn't increase the polarization, the inequality, and the bifurcation of society as we know it. Because what I can tell you as a, as a someone who's r- run businesses is an unequal, hyperpolarized, bifurcated society is bad for business. Um, and when I see gridlock, be it in Albany or the city council or in Washington, and this will sound like I'm advocating for something I'm not advocating for as strongly, I'd like to think that good corporate actors will be able not so much to fill the role of governance systems, but will lead the way in driving that innovation. Because I don't necessarily see that coming from the electeds at this current moment in time. You're an optimist. I'm an optimist. Yeah. Um, that's from the Amazon perspective. From the community, Long Island City, Queens, New York City perspective, how do you see it? In other words... Lessons learned for Amazon, maybe. Yep. But five years from now, are we going to wake up and go, "What the?" Look at the poll. F look the, the poll that the poll that came out last week. I wish I had the number. You may have it in your brilliant research. Is that the actual people who lived in that area, who lived where it was going to go, wanted it, wanted it. Um, and so that's where I think there's a, a failure of the system. Like if they wanted it, but there were these massive protests. Like what? I mean, that's it, its own dynamic. Well, it's its right? own the dynamic. Loudest. The loudest got it, and now you have folks who live there. Like, wait a second. Yeah, like that's kind of what I'm going after. That yeah, but, that, but, that's that was a missed opportunity, obviously. Yeah, but it's it. You know, we just saw yesterday Netflix is having a, you know, a relatively yeah. more modest expansion, but. Uh, you know, New York City, is, it, it, this was not the last opportunity we ever had, right? This is a vital city and will continue to be. And we don't need to, uh, you know, get down on our knees and beg uh, Amazon to come here uh, on their conditions, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, well, I, 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 I can say. understand the position that a politician is in where they need to you know, show jobs. they got, they, yeah. yeah, they got to show that they're doing something. But 
it's hardly the last big company or even the last big tech company that is going to come to this city with a proposal to bring a whole lot of jobs here. So, uh, you know, mistakes were made. But, uh, you know, I'm an optimist both about what it signaled but also for the city. Like, we, we it's... Uh, um, Amazon misplayed this just as much as the as the the other fair, side. Fair did. Enough, that's a, I think everyone. Enough. I think that's everyone great, misplayed. That's a great. That's everything, well put. Everyone mis. You don't have to have a winner and a loser in this. Yeah. Like you can just say we misplayed this um, ac- across the board. Someone would argue, no, it's great. Amazon is not here. We didn't misplay it at all. This is exactly what we wanted. Full stop. Um, I, I I think we mi- I think it was misplayed across the board because I think there may be some good short term feelings oh, we got Amazon out or whatever. But I think in the long term, it was a missed opportunity to think about how we, uh, as a city, both with people coming inside and from outside, and engage in, a, in an ethical, just way for as many people as possible. And now there's people who live in the community who are like, wait, we wanted it. It just, it, it was messy and ugly, and it was, it was not at, at the level of future consciousness that we would have wanted to see. You know, uh by way of starting to wrap up, this has been a great conversation. Um, it's it, it's just interesting how these things play out because I had my immediate rush of feeling uh, when they pulled out was we're better without you. We don't need you. We're New York City. We will be fine. You tried to dictate. You got rebuked. Let's move on. Um, I kind of had that same feeling after the West Side Stadium died, and then we got Hudson Yards in its place, which is a freaking mall. And I'm now dying that we didn't have a football stadium there because I think it would have been way better. So I guess we'll see how this stuff all plays out. I mean, you know, weird analogy, but, uh, you know, sometimes you think things are going to get better and they can get worse. Well, it's a lesson that all comes down to personality, right? Like, uh, a lot of it does. A lot of right? this stuff Bloomberg has to get done, case, right? right? They, you know? they, they dropped the ball on the West Side negotiations with Sheldon Silver, right? And, you know, was the leader of the world's largest company distracted by some personal life stuff at the time this was all going down? Yeah. Maybe. Right. Right? So uh, it takes people to get these things done. So, you know, it's... Uh, Right. Let's not over. Let's not over tectonic think it. Yeah. There's an element of just human, human people but, blowing it. But it. Yeah, but it, no, it, 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 there is a good thought experiment here. Had everything been equal about the size of the invest, how like how many jobs were going to come, everything, but the company was run by Oprah. Right. That's kind of where I was. Yeah. Would it have been? Different. I mean, not everyone gets a car, right? But you get a car. You get a, no, like, would it have gone down and looked differently? I, I don't know. But that's interesting. It's a, the, the thing, thing about we'll never it's, know. It's always about the individuals. It's always about the humans. Um, again, I hope everyone involved doesn't see this as total failure and total success, but uses it as a learning lesson. And actually, it dri- Look, we're having a conversation about it right now, and I hope it drives a conversation about what do we actually want for the future of our cities. And for the future of New York, for the future of our city, it's like this is a these are conversations that we actually don't often have, right? We think about who's the next leader or the broken subway and blah blah blah. But like, when was the last time we had a real honest like, what is New York over the over the next several decades? What do we want it to look like? Um, people have different ideas and different narratives, but this should be a great opportunity to actually have that conversation. And I hope I think it's amazing that we're doing it here. But I hope it's done by a broader, more diverse, inclusive set of actors in a coherent way, so instead of this just kind of happening, quote-unquote, out of the blue, we actually have, to to use my own idea or term, like, we have a long path for New York City. Like, what do we want it to be over the next several decades? Who's involved in that decision-making? What is the framework and this kind of values-based scaffolding that we use to have that conversation and make those decisions we just don't have? And by the way, most cities don't have that, most countries don't have that, and I'll go on a limb and say... Global civilization doesn't have that. We most have individuals. Most individuals. individuals. Like, yeah. why do I make these? I want to get my kid into college. I yeah, we're, we are. We are wired to be short-term amygdala feeling emotional entities. It worked really well for the past, you know, hundred thousand years ago on the plains of the Serengeti. But now we have to make really complex decisions that are transgenerational, and we just don't have the frameworks to have those conversations. 
on that note, on that very philosophical note, uh, I'm going to wrap up and thank you guys very much for, I think, a really engaging conversation. Uh, we'll have many more, let's hope, uh, on this program, in this studio, and otherwise. So thanks for coming in, guys. Thank you. All right. That's a wrap on this episode of The Medium Rules with Alan Baldishin. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget to rate us on Apple Podcasts.